Welcome to my course on HTML and CSS. Thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit more about this course. Let me introduce myself. My name's Emma and I learned to code during my PhD. Unfortunately, I learned the long and the hard way and I don't want your experience to be the same. I've always had a passion for teaching and I also have a passion for coding and data and I want to share and combine these with you. This course purely focuses on HTML and CSS. The idea behind this course is that if you spend seven and a half hours learning code through my videos, you will be able to confidently and competently make a website. So first of all, what we'll be doing? We will be learning HTML. We will be moving through each module at a good pace until you feel competent and confident using HTML. We will then bring in CSS that will help style your code, style your website, and you can help show how you can reflect your personality into your websites. Finally, we will code together a project, a portfolio website with four separate web pages that all link into each other. What we'll be focusing on is responsive design so that when people view your website on their mobile phones and iPads, it looks just as good as it does on desktop. This is very important. If you think this course sounds like the course for you, then please enrol and I look forward to seeing you on the course. If you want to drop me any questions, then please go ahead. Thank you very much and I look forward to teaching you. Hi guys and welcome to chapter one on HTML. In this video, we're gonna set up the folder structure for your files and we're also gonna set up our text editor. So first of all, let's create a folder on the desktop. So that was just a left click, new folder. And let's rename this. Okay, let's rename this code in a day. And let's go into that folder and create another folder. And let's call this HTML. Okay, fantastic. So now we're going to have a quick look at text editors. Um, my preference is Text Wrangler. Uh, it's a very easy to use and I like the way it formats the text. It makes it very easy to see what you're coding and what you have already coded. Um, so you can download that from the App Store. Uh, if you want to do that, if you want to pause the video and go and do that now. However, if you have got a different text editor you'd like to use, that's absolutely fine. Let's just get the text editor open. Okay, so I'll open my Text Wrangler. There we go, it opens with a new document. If we wanted to open another new document, you just go new, text document. As you can see, the folders that you've created are on the left. We don't need both of them, so let's just get rid of one of them. Okay, so let's type some code. Now, let's start off with the famous Hello World. And let's save that. So it's Control S on Windows, Command S on the Mac. And what we're going to do is we're just going to find our folder. So code in a day, HTML. And let's call this Hello World. And the important bit is .html. Perfect. So let's have a look now in the web browser. So you go File, Open File, it's already navigated through our file structure but let's go through that again. So we've got Desktop, Code in a Day, HTML, Hello World.html, Open and there we go. It's opened up our HTML file and it's showed us our Hello World. So congratulations, that's your first web page. The next lesson, we're going to be looking at the structure of a web page. Hello guys, welcome back to chapter 2. So in chapter 2, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the basic structure of a web page. So what we need to do is open up your text editor. Here we go. And we're going to save this new document as something different. So we're already in our HTML folder. You can see our hello world that we previously saved 
let's select all that and we're going to call it something called index.html. Now you use index as a name for basically the main page of your coding, the main page of your HTML. It's your home page in essence. So let's call that index.html. Lovely. Now what we need to do is write some generic pieces of code that appear in every single web document. Um, I'm going to just increase the size of this text so it's easier for you to see. Now what we're going to do is we're going to open, first of all, open a triangular brackets and put an exclamation mark. And what we're going to do next is declare to the web browser the document type it can expect to be interpreting. So we use doc type, one space, HTML, close the triangular brackets, new line. Let's save that. Lovely. The next thing we're going to introduce is something called tags. So a tag is basically, uh, it's syntax that's enclosed within two triangular brackets and you'll generally have an opening tag and a closing tag and between those two tags will be a section of code. For example, we're going to open a tag now called the HTML tag. So by doing that we do a triangular bracket open a triangle bracket close and in between we type, type HTML. Now as we know we have to put a closing tag we might as well type it now because that saves us having to remember in potentially three four weeks time when we're finishing up our web page. Now between these two tags we are telling the web browser that there is going to be HTML code. So we know our code is going to be quite long so let's give it a few line breaks there. So at the moment we're saying between line 2 and line 10 we're going to put some HTML code. The document type is HTML um, and the web browser knows what's happening. So next, the next tag we're going to look at is something called a head tag. So we open the head tag and you guessed it, we need to close the head tag. Now the head tag is going to contain a few details such as the title of the web page and some details about the document. This isn't things that are going to appear on your web browser but it's information that is useful to put in and can control the way that your web page is um, displayed. Okay so there's your head tag. Let's give a bit of space there because we know we're going to put some things in there afterwards. Okay so now we've got the next tag we're going to introduce is the body tag. Now the body tag is going to contain all the information, sorry there, an opening tag, all the information that you want displayed on your web page. So let's open the body tag and let's close the body tag. Okay, so we're going to put uh, quite a lot of code between these two here. So let's, we can keep these quite close because they will appear together at the end of the document. And there we have it. So this is our basic structure. We have our declaration of our doc type. We have the uh, first tag. As you can see all the tags are in blue where we tell the web browser between this tag and this tag you're going to have HTML code. Now when you have several pieces of different types of code in your document you will obviously declare within that section the different types of code but for now we're only worrying about HTML and that's what we've done. And we've also got our head tags. So like I said, we're going to put a few things in here. And the first thing we're going to put is our title. So let's open a title tag and close it. And between that title tag, I'm going to put the title of my web page. So let's say the greatest web page exclamation mark and let's save that okay fantastic so the impact of the title is that it will appear in your web browser in a few places so what you want we what we want to do is we want to open this file and have a quick look where is it going to appear so let's open it was file open this is within firefox i should say sorry open the index.html okay now where can you see that title? You can see it up here. And then also, if you were to bookmark this page, it's going to pre-fill the name. So it's the name of your web page. You do want to think what you want to put there because people will see it. 
Okay, so the next tag and the last tag I'm going to introduce to you in this video is something called a meta tag. So a meta tag is a little different. It's something called a self-closing tag. So we don't open it as we would traditionally and we don't close it as we would traditionally. We just do one triangular bracket. We type the word meta and then we put our information inside. So what I'm going to do is tell the web page what character set I want it to use. So we're going to use char set, which is character set. And we're going to equals and then quote utf-8. And then what we're going to do is we're going to close the tag. So that's called a self-closing tag. It's still blue. You know it's a tag, but you can see that you've opened it, put the information in between the tag and then closed it. Okay, lovely. And the last meta tag I want to introduce you to. So it's still a meta tag, but it's more and more important these days as people are viewing web apps on their iPad and on their mobile phone. We're going to introduce something called viewpoint. So we're going to say name equals viewpoint. And then what we're going to do is declare the width that that web page should be displayed at. So we're going to say width is equal to device width. And then we're going to close that tag off. Okay, lovely. There are some other bits of information you can put in your head section, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Let's uh, save that and voila. Okay, so just to summarize structure, we know that HTML pages are text documents. We know that HTML uses tags, uh, which are basically characters that sit inside angled brackets and they act like containers and tell you something about the information that lies between them. Now, tags are also, you'll hear them referred to as elements, and they usually come in pairs. So the opening tag denotes the start of a piece of content, and the closing tag denotes the end. Now, opening tags can carry attributes, which can tell us more about the content of the element. Now, that's what you can see here, is the opening tag, and it's a self-closing tag, carries information about the element itself. Now what we're going to have a look at the next one is headings and putting some information into the body of the web page. Okay thanks very much, see you in the next chapter. Hello guys and welcome back, uh, this is chapter 3 and what we're going to look at here is something called headings. So in the same way in for example a newspaper you would have uh, a main heading and a subheading it's the same in a web page. So HTML has six levels of headings and how we um, actually denote that we want the web page to display something as a heading is we open a heading tag. So it's within the body and we open a heading tag which is H and we're going to say it's the main heading so we're going to use H1. Like I said there's six levels so we've opened the H1 and we're just going to type main heading. Then we're going to close that off. Okay, lovely. So we should always place the heading within the body tags. And let's have a quick look how that looks on our web page. So we're going to open up our Firefox. We're just going to file, open file, choose our index. You see it's already rooted us to our HTML file. And there we have it, there's our main heading. Now the format that it is displayed in is generic and when we later move on to CSS um, code we can change the features of our heading like colour and font etc etc. So let's have a look at some of the other headings. So we could open a heading 2 and let's call this the second heading and let's close that. Lovely, and all we're going to do is refresh that. And there we go, we've got our second heading. As you can see, it's left a bit of padding between the two of them, which will be a generic level of padding. And then also, it's made the text smaller. So let's try a H3. Okay. 
Okay, there we go, same again. So we can see the padding's there and it's getting smaller and smaller. Let's keep going. Let's say something else here. Close the tag, save, refresh. There we go. Let's keep going. H5. Save. Refresh. Now, I generally don't use anything below heading 3, um, but you can do. These do exist, so it's always good to know. Really tiny. Save that and refresh. And as you can see, how small it gets. Now, as you can tell, the browser displays the contents of the headings at different sizes. So the contents of a H1 element is the largest and H6 is the smallest. Now, we, as I said, we can also adjust the size of our text in our browser and I'll show you how to control the size of the text and its color and the fonts use when we come to look at CSS. Okay, that's headings, guys, and uh, next we'll be moving on to paragraph text. Hello and welcome back to chapter 4, which will be looking at paragraphs. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to introduce some uh, kind of paragraphs of text into the web page. So when you look at other people's web page, you can see they've got a heading, then they've got a section of text, and what that is called is a paragraph. Okay, so what we're going to do to denote it's a paragraph is we're going to open a P tag. And we want a paragraph. Let's give a bit of space. I don't like it when they're all bunched up. So we're going to give this paragraph a closing tag as well, so we don't forget. And between this paragraph, we can type... This is a great paragraph. So you might want to write a bit about yourself. Let's save that and let's have a look what that looks like. So as you can see, it's paragraph text. It's not in bold like the heading is and it's smaller. So what you might want to do, keep that on the same line, is then write another paragraph. Maybe you want to introduce somebody. So you might want to say, this is my friend. And let's close that. Let's make that a capital because that is annoying me. Okay, so let's refresh. Now, as you can see, because it's two different paragraphs, there is padding between the first one and the second one which is this gap here. Now, what if we want to, for example, write two lines? So you might think, right, let's put in a second line. Uh, my name is Emma. Let's refresh that. Okay, so it's ignored the fact we've put a line uh, break in there. So what we need to do is to tell it we want a line break, and we do that using a break tag. So we open the triangle brackets, we put in the BR, and something it's a little bit different here, we put a space and then we close it off. Now what we should see here, there we go, and that is how you put a line break in. Okay, so there's a few more things you can do to your text, um, and you might want to make, for example, your name bold. So within your paragraph tag, or section. Let's make this a little bit separate. What you can do is make Emma bold and that's using a tag called strong. So we open up a strong and we close it where we want the bold to finish. So it might be before the exclamation mark, it might be afterwards, but I'm going to choose afterwards. I'm going to save and then we're going to refresh and there we go. Okay, so there's a few tags there for you to take in. We've got the paragraph tag, and this is to surround the words that's going to make up the paragraph, and we've got our opening P tag and our closing P tag. Now, by default, the browser will show each paragraph on a new line with some space between it and any subsequent paragraphs. If we want to create quite a few lines of text, 
we need to incorporate our line break tag to tell the browser when to start a new line. And we've introduced the strong tag, which makes words bold. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much, and I'll see you in the next chapter. Hello, and welcome back. So basically, um, I know how boring HTML can become in these constant videos of how to do little tasks here and little tasks there. So what I want to do, which is probably unlike any other um, videos, is I want to bring in CSS now. So CSS um, can make HTML fun, you can play around with your web design straight away and start getting a feel for how you control um, a web page because as you can see what we've coded now is probably quite far away from websites you see on the internet. So first of all let's go and create a CSS file. Now we will be using the text editor like this for as well but instead of a HTML ending um, we will have a CSS. So let's do that. It is as simple as file, new text document and then we're going to control S or command S and save it and we're going to call this style. Now like index is your generic naming um, of your home page, style is the generic naming of the first CSS file. So we're going to do style.css and we're going to just save that and it's also in the HTML folder. Okay lovely. So now we have a style sheet and we have a index sheet and we've got a heading here, a main heading, a paragraph, some some bold words and uh, five other different heading types that you can have. So what I want to do is I want to style my heading, my first heading and to do this in CSS you would type the element which is the h1 that you want to style and you open up a curly rocket and then we're going to go new line and what we're going to do is we're going to specify a colour so it's the Americanized spelling which I know is not ideal colour and then we're going to call it say blue now there are some colours CSS automatically knows and there are some colours it doesn't and we'll go into that in more detail in a moment and then I'm going to close off that styling of that element there we go. Now let's refresh our web page and have a look at our main heading. Right, so nothing has happened. The reason for that being is that currently these two files are working independently and what we want them to do is work together. So in order to do that we need to link this style document into this index document and we do that in the head section here. So I'm going to show you how to link in the style sheet and then the web browser will know that's where it needs to go to get the style to tell it how to display features of the, of the web page. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up a link tag then we are going to tell it where it is So it's called style.css. Because it's in the same directory, which means it's in the same folder as the index, we don't need to specify a name path. So if, for example, you had this saved somewhere else, you would have to specify the exact path, which, as you can see over there, is desktop, code in a day, HTML, and then the, the style file, um, file. So if you had that, for example, in your documents, you'd have to specify that so it knew where to look. Okay, so we've told it where it is. We're going to now tell it what type of file it is. So we're going to tell it it's a, it's a text slash CSS file. And then we're going to tell it it's a style sheet. Ooh, that's not how you spell sheet. Okay, so as you can see, it's a self-closing link as well. So we're going to close that off and save it. And let's refresh this and have a look. Voila, there we go. So while the browser was looking to display the HTML document, it noticed we'd linked in a style sheet, which it understands will dictate the style of HTML. And it's gone in there and seen that we want the heading to be displayed as blue. Now, 
I think that being able to adjust colours it and and play around with it gives you more of a feel of what you're going to be doing. And for those out there with a kind of creative and design eye, this is the best part for me. So basically, I want to introduce you to colour codes um, that you'll be using in CSS. And it will be only be brief because I don't want to go into too much depth here because we do have a full course on CSS. But this little bit can kind of integrate with HTML and help you um, stay interested, I think. So we've got the colour blue. Now, we might want a very strange shade of pink. Unlikely, but let's say we do. So there is something you can use called a hex code. And this is this will also be understood by CSS and will denote a certain shade. So the best thing to do is go onto a website, which I have open here, called w3schools.com, and they have a colour picker. And what you need to do is just choose a colour. So let's have a look here. Quite like that blue. Mm. It's not great. And then you can choose the shade of that blue you want. So I'm going to choose this shade. So we're going to copy that code there. I'm going to pop it in here. I'm going to save that. And then we're going to go back to the greatest website ever. And let's refresh. There we go. It knew what colour it was and it's changed it. So that's somewhere we can get our colours from. Um, and we can start bringing in some kind of design and make it a little bit more exciting to look at while we learn some more HTML. Okay, that's great. I'm going to get back to HTML now, but hopefully that's given you a nice little break and allowed you to do a little bit of uh, uh, introducing creativity into web design. Hello, and what we're going to do now is this video is we're going to continue on with HTML. Um, we've introduced a bit of colour and excitement into our web page. So now we're going to look at something uh, called lists. Um, so I'm going to show you how to put numbered lists, bullet lists, and definition lists into your web page. Now lists are very useful um, because obviously if you're writing a recipe web page, you might want to list the method and the ingredients. Um, or, for example, if you were writing a introduction page, you might want to list some details about yourself, which is what we're going to do now. So, let's change this so it becomes a page about ourselves. So, let's say here are some details about me. And what we're going to do first is we're going to put in a ordered list. Now, an ordered list is created with the tag OL. So let's open up the tag OL and let's close that off as well because we know we're going to have to eventually and we know in between we want to put stuff so we'll tab that down. Now each item within the list is placed between an opening list tag. So we open up the list tag and let's close it as well. And then between that list tag, we need to put what we want to put in here. So here's some details about me. Let me think. I love to code. And then we might want to put another. Now I'm not going to write it all out again. Copy and paste is your friend. And then we're going to change this to something else. So I love to code and I love to teach. Okay, so we've got two list items there, and let's have a look what that looks like. There we go, so it's an ordered list, which means you're going to get it ordered one to however many list items you have. And that's that, so well done, that's your first list. Now let's create an unordered list and see what that looks like. Okay, so... Now we know our ordered list is going to finish here. We bring up the close. And let's open an unordered list. As you can see, most of these tags are self-explanatory and quite intuitive. So it's it's actually, once you get used to it, it's a very nice language to learn. And it's a brilliant language to start off with. So here we go. An ordered list. And I want to... Maybe let's bullet point 
where I have travelled. So travelling, another one of my favourite things to do. Where I have travelled. Let's close that off. And then let's open a list item tag and close it. Sometimes it's easier to copy and paste these before you've put anything in. And then you can just pop it in the middle then. So let's see. Let's go Thailand. Australia. And more recently, Austria. Let's save. And refresh. And there we go. We've got a unordered list. So everything in the list is placed between an opening li tag and a closing li tag and the li stands for list item browsers will indent list by default sometimes you may see a type attribute used with the ul element to specify the type of bullet points so circles and squares and so on but it is better to use um, css to do that so we'll cover that later on in css Okay, so there is also something called definition lists. Now, a definition list, for example, will become in handy if you were um, writing a list of ingredients for a recipe, for example, but you wanted to describe each item in the list separately. So let me give, let me show you what I mean. So, a definition list. We're going to open this using the tag D1. And let's do our closing tag. Now, the term that we want to define, let's say, for example, we're going to say a little bit about Thailand. So um, let's pop in DT. Now, that is a tag used for the term that you want to define. And let's say Thailand. And then I want to put in um, a definition around Thailand so people have a bit of background. For that, we're going to use the tag DD, and I'm going to say visited, oh, no, three times is in Southeast Asia, speaks Thai. Then what we're going to do is close that off, okay, and to kind of see the effect, I'm going to do another one because it will then we're going to do D, T, let's look at Australia. Okay, so we've closed it off and then what are we going to say? Visited in 2008, so long ago. Uh, Travelled the East Coast speaks English. Here we go. Let's save that. Now let's refresh our web page and see what that looks like. Okay, so you can see what we've done there. So we've defined a term and then we've put some information around that. So that can be very useful if you're doing a, a website that you want to contain information. Um, it's quite a nice way to display it. Okay, so also there's something that I want to introduce called nested lists. Uh, now what we can do here is put a second list inside another list. So for example, I might want to say, where did I travel in Thailand? So what we're going to do is put another unordered list in here. Let's close it off as well. And then let's have a list item. Okay, and where did I go? Let's have a I went to Bangkok. And where else did we go? We can copy and paste this down, that's no problem. Okay, let's save this and have a look what that looks like. Okay, so you can see where I've travelled, you've got your main title Thailand, and then Within that list, you've put another list of where you've been. Okay, brilliant. 
Okay then guys, just to summarize, uh, there are three types of HTML lists. They are ordered, unordered, and definition lists. lists. Ordered lists use numbers, unordered lists use bullets, and definition lists are used to define terminology. And also you've learned that lists can be nested within, within other lists. And that, my friend, is lists. Hello, right, in this video we're going to be looking at the exciting world of images. So there's many reasons obviously why you might want to add a, uh, an image to a web page. You might want to include a logo, a photo, an illustration, a diagram, a chart, etc, etc. So there are several things we're going to consider when selecting and preparing images for web pages. Um, and we need to take time to get them right to make it look professional. Um, so, for example, we're going to show you how to include an image in your web pages using HTML. We're going to have a look at uh, which image format we want to use and show the image to the right size and also optimize that image for use on the web pages and therefore it's going to make web pages load a lot faster. Now, we can also use CSS um, to format our images and we will cover that in our CSS course so for now we're just going to focus on using the HTML code and getting familiar with that. Okay so images obviously are really important they set the tone for a website um, and probably the most favorite websites have beautiful imagery um, especially travel websites etc they really want to entice you in um, especially food websites as well which is a favorite of mine. So first thing we need to consider um, is we need to understand that as our website gets bigger we're going to uh, have a separate folder for many of the different elements we have so we're going to have a separate folder here for our images so what we're going to do is let's go into our finder and we're going to go desktop through our and we're going to create a new folder and just call this images and this is where we're going to store all our images that we then reference in from our website now there are many images you can get there are companies who sell stock images and these are images that you pay to use they tend to be the cliche happy smiling people high-fiving in a coffee shop um, I can give you a list of stock photography websites um, but just remember all images are subject to copyright and you can get quite a hefty fine if you do use an image that you haven't paid for so just be careful about that okay so now we've created our image folder let's go and find an image we like and put it in there so I've previously selected one from a recent trip to Venice and I've copied that and I'm going to paste it in here. So we have an image set up, that's fine. Let's get out of there. Now I haven't got a Venice on here, so why don't we add one? So list item, oh, don't want capitals, Venice, end list item. There we go. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add an image to the page. Now, to add an image to the page, you use a image tag. Uh, it's an empty tag, which means there's no closing tag. So there's no need to worry about closing it off. So what we're going to do is we're going to... Let's put it by... We'll put it here. We can play around with where we put it afterwards. It's just uh, practice getting it on the page. So we've got IMG. Don't close it. And then we're going to tell it the source, which is src equals, and then we're going to tell it the path it needs to go to. So from the folder we're in, we know we've created an images file. So we're going to put slash, and then we know it's called venice.png. Now let's just check that it was a png and not a jpeg. There we go, it's a JPEG, so I need to change that to JPEG. So we have told it to go into images folder and find a photo called Venice and display it. Now, if for any reason it cannot display that photo, sometimes you get a broken link picture, we can also put an alternative that we want it to display. So we're going to put alternative and we're going to just put the text picture 
of Venice. There we go. So if that doesn't display for any reason, um, we're going to just display the text. And let's put a title on it as well. What should we call it? Something... Venice, and then let's close the tag off. Oh, what am I doing? Oh my goodness, I've lost my mind. Right, there we go. Let's put this on two lines because we can see it then. That doesn't matter. Like I said, white space isn't important to HTML, so put it over two lines, it's not a problem. Um, and it's just so we can see that without having to scroll back and forth, which would be quite irritating for you guys. Okay, so let's have a look and see if that has worked. There it is. So under Venice, we have linked in a photo. Now, it's huge. It takes over the whole page and we need to format it. So let's find out how to do that. Okay, so you will often see a image element with two other attributes that specify the size of that. So that's exactly what we need to do because that picture is humongous. So first of all, we're going to specify the width and we're going to do that in pixels. So after the title, what we're going to write is width. And let's try and, you know, feel free to experiment with this. We're going to go 300. We don't want it too big. And we want the height to be 300 also. Now let's refresh and see what this looks like. Lovely. So that's brought that right down to 300 by 300. You can experiment with that and uh, yes, yeah, looking good. Now one thing to bear in mind is that images will often take longer to load than the code. Um, which makes up the rest of the page. Therefore, it's a really good idea to specify the size of an image so the browser can render the rest of the text on the page while leaving the right amount of space for the image to load. Now, increasingly, again, CSS is being used to style photos, but we will cover that in our CSS um, modules. However, the HTML is does it brilliantly as well, so let's get familiar with that first. Okay, so the other thing to bear in mind here is alignment of images. Um, to obviously we want to be able to place our images exactly where we want them and we'll be using CSS to do this. We could, old code, older code does use a line um, but it's best practice now to use CSS so we're going to leave it as it is and we're going to focus on aligning all our different elements when we cover, we cover this in CSS. Okay, so images, as you know, often come with captions. Um, I'm going to introduce you to a term which you've probably heard, um, HTML5. So HTML5 is nothing to panic about. It's not particularly different from HTML. In fact, it's exactly the same, except it's better. So it's basically the differences um, between HTML4 and HTML5. There might be some new tags. Um, they've integrated maybe some media, but really it's nothing to worry about. So there is a HTML5 tag and it's called the figure tag. So as you can see here, what we can do is put this around our image and that allows us to associate a caption with that, that image. Um, now you can have more than one image inside the figure element um, as long as you want them all to share the same caption. Now browsers also sometimes indent the contents of the figure element. So we can just be aware of that and let's also add in a caption. So we need to add in the figure caption and what we want to do is we've got our image here, which is fine. And after the end of our image, let's make this a bit bigger for now so we can see the end. Well, let's just put this on the second line. Okay, so what we want to do there after this is we want to add in a line break because we obviously want our caption not on the same line as the image. And then there we go. There's your line break. And then let's put in a fig caption and the tag for that is fig caption. So, very intuitive. And what should we say here? Figure caption. A, in fact, it was the only sunny day in Venice. It rained the whole time. And then we're going to close that figure caption. 
Okay, let's have a look what that looks like. So we want to get rid of this. And there we go. We've got a lovely caption there. Just telling us that the, it was the only sunny day in Venice. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so just to summarise, we've introduced the image tag. We uh, know that we need to use the SRC to specify um, where we're going to be finding our image and we have to specify the file path. And best practice, have an images file so it doesn't get all muddled up with your uh, text editor files. Um, also, we need to be aware of the size of the images because it will affect the space that the web browser saves for that images as images do load slower than text. Um, I save most photographs as JPEGs. Um, you can use, as I said, the other PNG files and sometimes they are better for different types of images. But for photographs, let's just keep it as JPEGs. It keeps it simple. And that is images. Okay, guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be looking at tables. Um, now, there's several types of information you want to display in a table uh, or a grid. So you've got sports results, size, stock results, train time tables. There's many things that you can kind of put into a table format and it's really useful to know how to do it. Now, this is all getting a bit messy, um, although we have learned some fantastic things. Why don't we get rid of most of it? So let's keep our main heading. Let's save that. Why don't we rename this tables? Let's refresh that. So that's all gone. And let's have a look at tables. Okay, so with tables, um, obviously we need to think about it as a grid. And each block within that grid is referred to as a table cell. It, think of it as Excel. And in HTML, a table is written out row by row. So to start a table, what we want to do is have a table tag. So we're going to open that here, like so. And then what we're going to do is indicate the start of the row by using, using let's close that off, using the table row tag. So you can guess what the table row tag is. It's TR. And let's close it as well. It's a good habit to get into closing and opening them because believe me when you forget to close a tag and you're searching through pages of code it's rather expensive on your time so the tr indicates the start of each row and it's followed by one or more td elements so there's one td element for each cell in that row and so let's put in some tds okay so don't know what data we want to put in here let's just put some numbers let's pretend the lottery numbers although you can't have 60 so this is probably why I never win the lottery um, and then TD let's have one more okay fantastic now, we can have several rows. We want several rows. So what, let's, rather than just retyping and retyping, let's make this a bit neater. Let's paste it down here. I don't like these TRs going off on their own journey. So let's change some of these. Save that. Brilliant. Okay, and let's have a look what that looks like. And there we go. We have got a table which has got three columns and three rows. Okay, so we've got a table and now we want to introduce table headings. So you can imagine what the tag is for table headings, That's right? It's TH. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a table row for our headings. So we need to open up a table row here and let's close it. There we go. And inside here, we're going to put some table headings. And like I said, the tag for table headings is TH. So because we've got three here and three here, we want to leave a column blank. 
so that we've got room to put in our headings going down the side. So you should always uh, put a heading on every column because otherwise it will mess up your formatting. So for this one, we're just going to leave this blank. So we're just going to close this off straight away. And then the next one we're going to open within the tag. We're going to put an element called scope. like so and close it off and then we're going to call this column let's say it's each day of the lottery you can call it whatever you want experiment with it you don't have to follow and what we're going to do is we're just going to copy this down Saturday, Oops, Sunday, there's no lottery on Sunday, but hey, we can do what we want. So there we go. Then what we're going to do is put some headings on the side cells. So to do that, we want to go down into our rows and because HTML fills tables by row, we put this within the row. Okay, so we go into this row of data here and what we're going to do is we're going to open up a table heading and we're going to give it the scope of row row there we go and then we're going to close that off after the quotation marks and let's call it uh, it was the first number let's say we're looking for correlations on the first second and third numbers and we're going to close it off and we're going to copy this down and we're going to call this one second number and let's copy it down again to the third row and we'll call this third number okay fantastic so Let's have a look at this tags because we've done a lot of work here and we've got our heading which we changed to tables. We then open our table tag. We then open our table row and this row is specifically for headings. So we've got an empty heading in the first row and then we've got three headings which are Friday, Saturday and Sunday and then we close off that table row. So let's have a look at what that looks like. Oh, now something's gone wrong with the bottom one. Let's have a look what that could be. So, third row, what we've got here, we've got scope, row, third number, and then we close it off. Potentially, have we not saved it? Correct. So, always trial it, have your web page open, saving, and having a look at what it looks like. Okay, so what we've got here then, we've got our empty column, as I specified here. Then we've got our Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We've got our row heading first number our row heading second number and our row heading third number there we go that's a pretty nice table okay so obviously we don't want our table to look as boring as that we can style our table now it's uh, best practice now to style it with css you can add in some attributes of html but it's the old way to code and therefore I'm going to be covering that in our CSS. Um, so as a summary, what we've got here is the table element is used to add tables to a web page. The table will be drawn out row by row and each row is created by the TR element. Now inside each row there's a number of cells which are represented by the TD element or, or a TH element if it's going to be a header. Now, there's a few other things that um, I want you to know about tables, but rather than go over them in a video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add them onto the PDF that comes with this video and you can have a play with it in your own time. Hello. OK, so in this video, we're going to cover something called iframes. Now, an iframe is like a little window. Um, it gets cut into your web page and in that window you can see another page. So the term iframe is abbreviation of inline frame. Now, a common use of iframes is you might see Google Maps um, that you uh, that link to the location maybe of your cafe that your website is promoting. Um, and it's a really nice way actually to add a bit of interaction to your web page. So 
let's add our iframe. Now I've removed the previous content, um, so it's a blank page here, and uh, you can save at each point you go along, and I know this might feel a bit uh, decompartmentalized, but when we bring it all together, it's um, at the end of this HTML module, it's all gonna come together nicely, and then we're gonna bring in CSS. But I don't want it to get too busy and too confusing, so I've uh, started with a blank slate for this uh, video. So first of all, let's put a heading in. Um, let's call it iframes. Now, I've updated the CSS color to purple just because I like to do little strange things like that to keep my brain alive. And then we're gonna refresh the page. And yes, there we go, our main heading, iframes. So iframe, surprising or not, is opened with a tag called iframe. So let's open that. Now we need to put quite a lot of attributes inside that opening tag, so we're not gonna close it off just yet. First of all, we're going to put the source. So because I know there's a few attributes, I'm gonna start a new line. And we're gonna put source is equal to, and then we're gonna put those two commas in. We're also gonna add in the height. So we'll put them in. And we're also gonna add in the width. So we'll put them in. Then we're going to close off that with a triangular bracket. And then we're going to close down the iframe tag. So that all leaves us now, we've just got to fill in, fill in these blanks. So let's have a look. What I'm going to use is the Lonely Planet for Venice. I want that to appear in the right hand side of my website. I want its height to be, let's call it 450, let's make it nice and square, 450. Let's save. And let's have a look. Okay, you see it's loading down the bottom. As you can see, it's not uh, the fastest thing to load. And there we have, we have our iframe. It's a section of our web page, if I make this a bit bigger. That's a section of our web page where we've got an insight into another web page. Now, I really like that. It brings the website live and you're also bringing new information and a new style into your own web page. So I think they're really useful. And um, another thing you can do, because often they're aligned to the right, is we can align this. So let's add another attribute here and we're gonna say align, we're gonna equal right. And let's have a quick look. There we go. And we've aligned it right. Okay, that's iframes. Thanks very much, guys. Okay, so in this video, we're gonna look at adding actual videos to your website. So again, this can really bring them to life. Um, it can make them a lot more interactive. Now we've got an iframe up here that we've added in our other video where we looked at the Lonely Planet having a embedded kind of frame within our website. So now we're gonna have a look at video. Okay, so we're going to add in a video onto our website. And to do that, we're going to use the video tag. Now there's quite a few attributes we need to add into the video tag. Um, so we're gonna open it up. Start over here, open it up and leave it open. Then we're gonna add in some attributes and I'll go through what these are. So first of all, the source, same as in images, we need to add in a source. We'll leave that blank for now. Then we're gonna add in something called a poster. So this will be a cover image that until your user clicks play, they all they see is the poster. Then we're gonna add in some height and width. Then we're gonna put in something called preload. Now preload is an attribute that tells the browser what to do. Uh, when the page loads, it can have one of three values. So it can have no value, um, which means the browser shouldn't load the video until the user presses play. Um, it can have an auto, so the browser should download the video when the page loads, and a metadata, so the browser should just collect information such as the size of the first frame and the track list and duration, etc. So we're going to just put preload in and we're not going to give it a value. Then we're going to put something in called controls. 
Now, controls, it's an attribute that indicates a browser should supply its own controls for playback. Often, if you don't put that in at all, you won't see your video appearing. And we're going to say we want the video to loop. So when it gets to the end, we want it to start again. Now, let's close the video tag. And let's start filling some of these in. So we know we've got the Lonely Planet, which is 450. So let's make this a bit smaller. We'll put that as 300. Oh, 300. And I let's have a look. I have got a MP4 video that I've added to my images file. Now it was just a video taking off my iPhone. Uh, when you take it and you send it to yourself from your iPhone, it comes across in a MOV format. So what you need to do is just down, go on to Google, um, have a look at some free converters, and just convert it into an MP4. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to link that in on our website, same way as we would images. So we're going to, it's in the images folder, and it's called c.mp4. And the post we're going to use, just for ease, because we know it's there, is Venice dot jpeg okay now let's save that let's have a look to see what that looks like okay so as you can see here we've got our iframe and we've got our video and we have our poster of the venice image and then we press play we've got our video of the sea so let's mute that because we don't want the sound um and there we have it, so we'll wait till it gets to the end to make sure the loop function's working. Yep, there we go, it's looping around. Okay, brilliant, and that is how you embed a video onto your website. Okay guys, let's have a look at how to add some audio files to your web browser, to your web page. So, as you can imagine, there is an audio tag we can use. Um, the only space we're going to need is for the play bar, uh, so we don't need to worry about removing the video or the iframe off to make some space, so we're just going to add in, under the video, let's add in some audio. So, first of all, we want to add in the audio tag. Now there's some attributes to put inside it, so we're going to leave it open. The initial one being the source, we know that one well. And then we're going to put in controls which is pretty much the same as the video. Um, so it just indicates whether the player should display controls. Um, if you don't use this attribute, there'll be no controls shown by default. Um, but you can specify your own controls, but for that you'll need to use JavaScript. So let's put the controls in for now. And we'll put in autoplay. Um, this just indicates the audio should, st audio should start playing automatically. Now, we don't have to put this in, we can just put uh, a preload in, which means instead of autoplay, we would just write preload as in the video, which would mean that it would start playing once they had pressed play, but it would preload when they loaded the web browser. But we're going to put autoplay because we're going to be one of these annoying websites that play in the background. And we'll loop it. Why not? Okay, and then we're going to just close that off. And then we're going to close the audio tag, like so. Now the source, I have saved a mp3 file to a audio folder. So what I've done there is where we've got our images, I've just gone new folder, called it audio, and within that we've got our mp3. Now if yours is a strange name like Minders, you can just go to get info, and there's the name there, so we're just going to copy that. Let's get out of there. And we're just going to put in the path, so it was audio forward slash, there we go. And let's see if that starts. Hopefully it will. There we go. Can you hear that? Some exciting audio. Brilliant. So we have audio, video, iframes make your websites really interactive. Um, we haven't even begun styling them yet, but you can see how you can add in so many exciting things and design a really, really, really cool website.
Hello, so welcome to forms. Forms are quite an interesting one um, and what we're going to look at here is the HTML side of forms and the reason I say HTML side of forms is because of the way forms work you need to bring in another language that is kind of server side as opposed to user side which is say HTML. So basically if you think about a form when a user fills in a form and presses a button the information gets submitted to the server so the name of each form control and by form control i mean username or password also gets sent to the server along with the value the users entered so then the server processes the information and it will use a processing language such as php um, java vb.net and it will also store the information in a database um, so then what will happen is if you need that information back the server will create a page to send back to the browser of the information that's received. Now, what to do that, we need to understand PHP or a language that the server kind of talks in. So what we're going to do and focus in this lesson is the HTML side, we're going to make the form, and then later on we're going to introduce some PHP scripting that you can put and attach and link into your HTML that will allow you to get that information directly emailed to you every time somebody fills it in. Now, it's not complicated, so don't worry, and forms is especially easy in the HTML side. So let's get started. Okay, so as expected, forms live within a form tag. So what we're going to do here is just open our form tag. I'm going to close it down here. Like so. And within, normally with form, it will have some attributes, and attributes obviously live inside this bracket here. So what it would have is an action. So every form element requires an action attribute. Um, its value is normally the URL for the page on which the server will receive the information the form has been submitted. So what that's going to be is your PHP. So you'll have your name of your PHP script, and your server will read that script. It wouldn't be able to read HTML because that's not a server-side language. So the action would be just kind of popped in like this. We haven't got one yet, so what we'll do is we'll just say um, example.php. Okay, and then forms would also have a method. So it, forms can be sent using one of two methods, and they're called get and post. Now with the get method, the values from the form are added to the end of the URL specified in the action attribute. So it's ideal for short forms such as search boxes, etc, etc. And when you're just receiving data from the web server and not sending information that should be deleted or added to a database. So it's not confidential. With the post method, the values are sent in what's known as HTTP headers. So as a rule of thumb, you should always use the post method if your form either allows users to upload a file, it's very long, has sensitive data, or adds information to or deletes information from a database. If the method attribute is not added, the default is to use the get method, so it's important we put that in. And all we do there is put method at the end, and then we choose post. Okay, now what, we're not going to put that in at the moment because we haven't got that PHP script, so we're just going to use the form and create the HTML side. Okay, so our input um, that we're going to put first bit in will be something like a username. So what we're going to do is open our p tag, type username, like so, and then what we want to do is start an input. So we type in the input tag, and within that we put some attributes. So we put type is equal to text, and we put name. Now this is the name you want to give the box, and it's important when we're getting data back that it will come back in, in the format you give the names out. So we'll give this uh, an obvious one of username, and we'll say size equals 15 and we want a max length so the max of characters that they can put in so we've got 30 and then we're just going to close that off got the equal sign there 
Okay, so we're just going to close that off and then below that we're going to close off the P tag and then we're going to save that and let's have a look what that looks like. Okay, let's get rid of this. So yeah, there we go. We've got our username um, and a box and there's some details it already pre-fills with there. Okay, so there's our first box in our form. Okay, so now let's enter a password and what we might want to do here is put it in a line break for the format and we'll just call this password okay okay there we go now what we're going to do is enter something called a text area so there's a text area element that's used to create a multi-line text input but unlike other elements it's not an empty element and therefore we need to have an opening and closing uh, tag so what we're going to do is we're going to just type text area text area we're going to save that and let's just have a look what it pops up okay so it gives us a box there we haven't put any text around it so let, why don't we put in a lovely line break and then put in some text so please comment on your stay okay so you can see you've got the text box there and this actually drags out by the corner here so if there's a lot of text in there you would be able to see it so now we're going to introduce something called radio buttons and radio buttons allow users to pick just one of a number of options so we'll use this for example for gender so let's just copy this here we'll put it here and let's call this gender and the type will now be radio gender and we're going to give this one a value now when the server comes back to you with the information it will report this value okay and then we're just going to say mail Oops, sorry no that should go after there so we're just going to say mail and then we're going to do it again for the female We'll just change this to female and change this to female. So what that looks like. There we go. So we've got uh, our two radio buttons there. So let's now add something called a checkbox. So checkboxes allow users to select and deselect one or more options in answer to a question. So it's very similar to your radio buttons. So let's take Let's take this whole area here and we're going to how many pets oh let's make it which pets which pets do you have and what we're going to change to is from radio we're going to put checkbox Okay, and we're going to say name pet and this one will say cat I love cats I'm a frustrated renter so I don't own my own cat I say own, I shouldn't say own um, check box change this one to pet and then we're going to why don't we have something lovely like a unicorn and we'll put in one more sheep you can imagine what kind of forms I would make sheep and dog there we go two great unusual choices surrounded by some normal pets let's have a look what that looks like 
Okay, there we go. So we can now select all of them if we have a farm, or you can deselect them like so. You might want to have one automatically checked. So here would you would put checked equals checked. So cat would automatically be checked. Okay. So now we're going to add a drop down list box. So a drop down list box, also known as the select box, it allows you to select one or more options from a drop down list and we use an element called select. So let's pop that under here and just open up that element like so and we'll close it off. Okay. So first of all, the name. So the name attribute, like I said, indicates the name of the form control being sent to the server along with the value that they've selected. So let's put a name in. What should we have for the drop down? Last holiday. Okay. And then what we're going to do is add some options in. So option, value, then we want to put in the name of the per place, so let's choose somewhere, Vienna, and then we're just going to close, let's bring that close tag up, nope, we haven't written one yet, so we want to close that option off then. Okay, let's put a value in. So let's call this one Vienna. And then what you want to do is just copy that, make as many options as you like. Let's choose another beautiful city, Budapest. And Prague. Don't forget to change these. Okay, so we've got the select, we've got the option, uh, three times for each of our options, and then we close off the select. Okay, so let's see what that looks like there. Okay, so we've got three drop downs. Now what you might want is your top one to say choose an option. So what we'll do is we'll put an option in. Call it choose. Okay, so we've got choose an option and then you've got your three that you can choose from your drop down. So most importantly now what we need is a submit button. So let's put in a button. So we're going to put input space type is equal to submit. Put that in the parentheses and then name equals subscribe. Or whatever you want to put on your button goes in here. Um, let's put submit value equals submit. And then let's close that off. We want a line break. That's what happens if you don't put your line breaks in. Now, forms are normally styled with CSS, so when we go through our final website, we will be creating a form on there, and we will go through how to style it as well. Why won't this break? Because it's inside the tag, ladies and gentlemen. Annoying mistakes like that are what get you. So there we go, is your submit button. We'll choose an option, Vienna, we'll put female. Let's submit. As you can see, they've come up on the top there. 
and that's because we haven't put the post method on we've got the get method because that's the default okay so that's forms for now uh, that's quite a lot of things introduced there there are a few other things you can add like multiple choice drop down boxes um, file upload like you we upload a file quite a few extra things you can add um, but this is kind of all the main things you need for a form